have one, have one for the Fred, but I have not done it yet. I should. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Happy Monday. Hey, Jeff. <laughs> Bye. Feel good. All right, getting started. So welcome, everyone. Thank you all so much uh, for joining us today. Um, today, my name is Jessica Meyerson, and I'm the community advisor to the Software Preservation Network, as well as research program officer at Educopia Institute. Uh, just a little housekeeping before we get started. As always, uh, everyone but hosts and guests are asked to be muted throughout the webinar just to maximize the audio and visual quality of this recording. Um, speaking of which, you'll note to your top left that we are currently recording as we have the previous episodes in this series. If you have any questions during the presentation, um, please do type them into the chat box uh, of the Zoom control panel and I will bring them up during the presentation. And we'll also have time for questions at the end. Um, every episode will be recorded, transcribed, and posted to the SPIN website. We're currently working on this workflow. Um, and these will be freely available for all. Today we're presenting episode four, working with source code and licenses. This is uh, a discussion with members of the Code of Best Practices research team and esteemed guests, which include Dana Boquin, um, who's the head librarian at the Center for Astrophysics, an organization where uh, Harvard and Smithsonian scientists work together on space missions and research. Dana is responsible for all library operations and leads efforts um, to facilitate software preservation and code attribution within the astronomy community. She's also an advisor to SPIN's um, easy program of work the Emulation uh, as a Service Infrastructure, and a member of uh, Archive's IT Advisory Group, as well as a member of the Center for Astrophysics Scientific Computation Advisory Board. We're also joined today by Lauren Work, who's the Digital Preservation Librarian at the <laughs> University of Virginia Library, where she's responsible for the implementation of digital preservation strategies and systems. She's also the project lead for uh, University of Virginia Libraries Fostering Communities of Practice SPIN project and serves as the UVA Library Node Configuration Coordinator for the SPIN Easy Program of Work. Your research leads and facilitators for today's episode include Brandon Butler, Director of Information Policy at the University of Virginia Libraries, joined by Peter Yazi, Professor Emeritus at, Univers at American University Washington School of Law. Professor Yazi is one of the originators of the Fair Use Best Practices Movement and is co-author of the Software Preservation Code of Best Practices for Fair Use, um, along with Brandon Butler, Pat Ofterheide, and Krista Kopp. This is the continuation of our seven-part series of webinars, which explore the Fair Use Code as well as other legal tools for software preservation, and it's co-hosted by the Association of Research Libraries and the Software Preservation Network. And so in this fourth episode, Brandon, Peter, Dana, and Lauren will discuss how fair use applies when working with licensed software and source code. And with that, I'll hand it off to Brandon. Great, thanks, Jess. So uh, as you see there, we have a little roadmap of what we're gonna do today. First, uh, Peter and I are gonna talk a little bit about principle five of the Code of Best Practices. Uh, if you've been here before uh, for the last couple of these, you know that's the the document that we've been sort of marching through for the first several episodes of the webinar series. And principle five brings us to the end of the code, uh, of the principles in the code, and that principle deals with source code. And so we'll talk a little bit about what's in the code of best practices about code uh, of the source <laughs> variety. And then we'll also talk about something that I think is really, uh, really important for us to talk about in this community, which is the relationship between fair use on the one hand and licenses or contracts on the other hand. It was the thing that really, from the very beginning, um, sort of was at the, there's the first question that happened, you know, as soon as we would bring this issue up, whether, with, whether we're talking with, you know, lawyers or uh, librarians, um, there was always this question of, of licenses, since licenses are so prevalent in software. Uh, so once we, Peter and I, give a kind of overview of these legal principles, um, then we'll have we'll hear from uh, Dana Boquin about her work with source code, uh, 
and um, how the kinds of principles and the best practices uh, might be helpful to her. And we'll hear from my colleague, uh, Lauren Work here at UVA, about some of the work uh, we're doing with licensed software. And then we'll open it up. We'll talk amongst ourselves, and we'll also have questions from you all. Brandon? So, yes, Peter. Before you summarize principle five, I wanted to make a, a more general observation that looks backwards and, and also specifically to this principle about how this code came about. Mm. The, we've talked before and we'll be speaking a little bit again later today about the preliminary research that we did and all of the people who were so kind as to spend hours with us on the telephone making us understand about how copyright and fair use did or didn't operate in the software preservation space. And we've talked a little bit about what came next. That is a series of what were in effect small or focus group meetings among preservation professionals at sites across the country, which we moderated and organized around topics that had come up recurrently in the research at the beginning of the project that I described a moment ago. And the principles, including the ones we've talked about in the last several webinars and principle five that we're discussing today, come out of those small group meetings. They are our best effort to, to sort of to write down and, and concretize what the groups of professionals who we talked about who we talked with, believed were good practices. That wasn't part, quite the end of the process because once we had done that, we then filtered our good faith summaries of the group consensus through a bunch of lawyers just to make sure that the group and the, the sort of general perceptions of where the law stands weren't out of sync, so to speak. They weren't. But... The process as I've described it, which is the same process that we've used with, I don't know, 12 or 13 or 14 different community-based practice groups over the last 15 years, is in itself of some interest because it's an obvious source of strength in terms of the, the broad-based foundations that the final principles have, but it also has been from time to time a source of, I don't want to say vulnerability, it's the wrong word, but it's been something that, that has been questioned, particularly by advocates of, of long, strong copyright over years, and the question has always taken some version of the the, you know, lunatics in the asylum trope, you know, how can you leave something as important up to the law as the law up to these people who are not lawyers first and who are collectively self-interested in having as much freedom to operate within whatever domain they are in, the domain of classroom teaching or the domain of documentary filmmaking or the domain of, of art history um, writing, you won't get a balanced result if you just talk to the people who always want more for less. <clears throat> now, obviously, we don't believe that critique because we've gone on doing it that way for some fairly successfully for years and years and years. And one of the reasons we don't believe that critique is because in practice, that's not how it works out. In practice, when you get a group of people who work in a practice area together, it turns out they, they represent and they know people who represent and they feel affiliation with people who are in all sorts of different positions across the spectrum from wanting the greatest degree of access and freedom to use on the one hand to being quite concerned about proprietary rights on the other. So one of the things that we discovered about your community, which we found fascinating, is that the individuals, the preservationists, if you will, who were in our groups had all kinds of lines and connections to, to the programming community. 
and some of them were ex-programmers, some of them were current programmers, some of them had been in the industry and then had moved over to the archival side, some of them were still working in for-profit settings, but as archivists. And the result, as has been true in every community that we've worked with over the 15-year history of this project, is that the end product is a very balanced one. It's one that doesn't just maximize the, the user's freedom of choice, if that term means anything, but also respects the legitimate interests of rights holders. And we've talked about some of the instantiations of that balance over the last several weeks, among them the fact that in connection with principle after principle, among the limitations that the small groups felt were important to include were ones that were designed to make sure that archival activities didn't compete directly with current active programs of, of commercialization run by copyright owners or their successors. That was one example. This is another. The fifth principle is another example of a situation in which the group of archivists that we dealt with felt very strongly that there were interests on both sides that needed to be accommodated. And so in addition to being interesting in its own right, it's also a nice illustration of what I would maybe slightly slightly arrogantly, but nevertheless perhaps usefully referred to as the, the, the genius of the process, not of us, because all we're doing is following along taking notes, but of the process itself. Sorry, Brandon. No, that's a really, uh, really useful intervention, Peter, because I think we've, we've jumped into the content of the code, but it's, it's uh, because it's sort of irresistible to, to just get into it, but it's good to remember where it came from. And I think this principle is, a, as you say, a really nice illustration of that. So, you know, principle five deals with working with source code, um, you know, sort of the human readable, right, version of software as it's sort of written by its authors. Um, they can be reused and recompiled and broken up and, 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 um, and so on. And in this uh, principle, what we find is that uh, it is fair use to uh, to preserve and make available this kind of material, but there are, as always, a series of limitations. And you know, another refresher um, on the general format of the code and the principles in the code. Um, each of these principles is accompanied by these limitations. These uh, to to sort of look under the hood again. What we what we do is we have these focus group discussions and we, and we propose, and they, these things evolve as the discussions evolve, but we propose a version of a principle and we poke at the principle and we shape the principle, but then we also um, ask for the outer bounds of its application. What are some things that you had better do or you had better not do if you want to stay within the realm of what this field believes to be um, a reasonable, moderate, centrist practice. And um, usually, this is where the rich discussion is. The yeah. principle, because it is so general, is relatively easy to get people to, to f agree to and refine. It's the limitations that are the real test of the group process. So, one good thing to remember about using this document or any of the other documents uh, to which it is related is that the, the limitations are integral with the principle. The principle doesn't have any independent meaning when severed from the limitations. And so, so it's, you, uh, as a result of all that, you move very quickly from the principle to the limitations. The principle will stake out a broad, fairly easily, as, as Peter said, fairly easily arrived at um, kind of zone. But then the limitations really help you define the boundaries of that zone. And so in this particular case, um, 
one thing that emerged very clearly in the discussions was that source code is very often donated by an author. And the authors of source code who donate their, their creations to uh, archives and special collections are just like the authors of unpublished manuscripts. And they have complex and you know, important thoughts about what should be done with that kind of material. And you know, the law of fair use, as we'll learn later on, um, can be made subject to the limitations in a contract. And the contract in a deed of gift or a donation agreement uh, can limit your rights just as much as anything else. And so you and we enter into these agreements under those kinds of terms because it's worth it, right? Because it's still worth it to get our hands on and to save and to make available in some way these materials. But it was really important um, to the groups that we spoke with as part of exercising your fair use rights to be conscientious about the limitations in donor agreements to keep them at the front of your mind and, and, you know, fair use does not overcome those limitations. You need to look to those terms uh, to govern what you do. Um, relatedly, and again, working from analogy to unpublished manuscripts, there was a lot of sensitivity to putting uh, source code online without an express grant of permission in the first place. And so there was a sense that, um, again, because this is, reusable content. This is um, code that could be broken up and, and um, deployed again in a new format. Um, and this may be code that was never released and so was maybe never intended to be used. Um, that again, you should be guided in some sense by the same kinds of policy considerations that you would use with unpublished manuscripts, which is not to say you would never publish it, but is to say that it's a different kind of a beast. Uh, than commercially available machine readable code. Um, the next limitation uh, asks you to um, limit access even by researchers um, to make sure that the level of access is related to the inquiry that they are engaged in, either by redaction or otherwise. And again, this was something that came out from the folks who've been collecting source code and told us, you know, that this kind of material is can be very sensitive. And so when you're, when you're making research access um, available, again, to be sensitive to how much access is appropriate to the research project, which is, again, actually strongly rooted in fair use law itself. The level of access that fair use permits always needs to be sort of calibrated to the underlying transformative purpose. Um, and then the final limitation is a very common one. Uh, it's something, and it's another indication of the good faith that Peter was describing before, which is um, communities of practice consistently, consistently uh, insist on attribution of authorship and ownership um, in these contexts as a way of providing, you know, proper credit and provenance for the materials in your collections and making sure that, you know, the folks that are using these materials understand where they came from. Um, so those are the limitations. They're few, but important, important to understand. Um, Peter, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I just want a couple of things to add. One is about the, the attribution one, because that's so interesting. Um, as those of you who are students of, of, of copyright law, as well as other things know, there's nothing in the copyright law that imposes any burden of attribution on anyone under any circumstances, save the narrowest range, which don't apply here. But what we've seen over 15 years in doing this work with different practice communities is that consistently, without regard to the domain, the professionals who are responsible for these best practices think that attribution is really important. And so, we can, we can, as Brandon has suggested, tie that to the law of fair use by characterizing it, I think, accurately as an aspect or a, or a factor in determining the user's good faith, which does sometimes enter into legal analysis. But it's also a, an ethical, a freestanding ethical imperative that I think in, in, in candor, 
the different professionals we've worked with over years, including in this context, the people who are doing software preservation, your community would probably have arrived at even if there weren't a specific legal hook on which to hang it. It's that important. The other thing I wanted to mention is the relationship between the fifth principle on the one hand and the other four principles that we've rehearsed over the last several webinar sessions on the other. Uh, the first four principles are, in a sense, uh, cumulative or cascading in nature. They start small and they grow out from there. A certain thing, bunch of things you can do almost with impunity, another bunch of things that you can do on your premises with very relatively few, although to the extent that they are expressed, of course, nevertheless, specific constraints. A larger, an, a, a, another set of activities, I'm now at principle three, which you can do on your own um, site, providing virtual access to members of your community. And then fourth, a set of activities that you can do online for a wider range of users in consortial and collaborative arrangements. And really those principles almost demand to be read together because as I say, they, they accumulate or cascade. I mean, you can choose your, you can choose your verb, but uh, one way or another, they build, one builds on the last. This is slightly different. This is a, a you could say, a kind of separate freestanding principle which isn't simply the inevitable outcome of the four that preceded it, dealing with what we understood as we went along to be something that the community regards as a very special and sensitive case. So I would urge you in thinking about the code as a whole, since we've now reached the end of our description of the principles, I would urge you to think about the, the cumulative relationship between the first four principles and to appreciate the significance of the fifth principle as a kind of as a kind of freestanding one. End of thought. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Um, so then, let me move to uh, fair use and licensing, and the. The starting point here, I think, or a good starting point, is the kinds of concerns that we heard when we embarked on this project. Again, from from you know lawyers and and librarians alike, uh, the grounding of the concern is that software, um, everything is now almost everything now feels like it's distributed with a license. Um, I think I saw the other day that Hudson Yards, this gigantic New York uh, real estate development, there's a there's a big fake staircase to nowhere that has a license on it that says if you take a picture, they own it. <laughs> and so licensing has escaped from software and, and you know, infected lots of other things, but software was um, way ahead of the curve here and has been distributed with contracts attached for a long time. And the, uh, the history of, of you know, clicking through and having to agree to things when you when you install your software has led to anxiety um, expressed in a number of ways. Um, you know, one of those is you know I can't do fair use on this software because I don't own it. I'm just a licensor. I'm I'm just a licensee. I'm just a a mere. You know, I'm I'm here entirely at the will of the copyright holder. So how can I do fair use? Um, another version of the story is you know, that the software license is, is the beginning and the end of my, my ability to use something. And if the license says yes, then I can. And if the license says no, then I can't. And that's all I need to know. <clears throat> um, another concern that we heard was, um, I, not only do I not own it, I, I'm not even a licensee of the software. I just got a box of coffee, right? Um, somebody licensed it at some point, but it, it ain't me. So how can I have any rights to use this stuff? Isn't it just sort of uh, radioactive now? 
And then finally, and this was sort of ubiquitous, uh, one of my favorite things was to ask people who were concerned about licenses which term they were worried about, you know, sort of what is it about the license that concerns you? And across the board, no one has read the licenses. <laughs> and, and sometimes they often, can't. Sometimes they can't. they're gone. Yeah, that's right. The licenses are gone. That is, you know, I'm assuming there was a license uh, because there was always a license in this era of software, but I can't find it. So I don't even know what the terms are. And so this was sort of where people uh, found themselves when we started these conversations. Um, and so we actually, I had to school myself and, and luckily, get, you know, I had Peter involved and he could school me a little bit too about how the big picture of licensing and fair use really work together. And Peter, I wonder if you could break that down for us for a little bit. Oh, I'd, I'd be very happy to. And, and I would just emphasize that at the very outset of this project, I think much of the skepticism, and there's always skepticism, that people in the community expressed about whether the exercise would be useful was around this issue of licensing. It was some version or variant, and Brandon has done a very good job in the preceding slide of showing what all of those were, of the of the proposition that, um, well, this fair use stuff is all nice and good, but in the end it doesn't matter because some license somewhere, whether I know what it says or not, controls. And that, that was a, a sort of a, was something that we had to talk our way and work our way through and in a way the the material that we're going over now and that is also in the in the appendix to the document itself about licensing sort of sums up what what that that working through of the material entailed and we certainly don't know that there could never be a case in which a license term could theoretically stand in the way of accomplishing some preservation project that was otherwise authorized by law under the Fair Use Doctrine. Because as, as you see here, there are basically two kinds of authorization for anything you want to do with actually or presumptively <coughs> copyrighted material. One is that you've actually got permission and the other is from the rights holder and the other is that you have permission in effect from the Congress and courts of the United States by law. And what I think was hard for people to understand and I hope we were successful in explaining and are trying to emphasize in the appendix and in this, this discussion today is that the fair use doctrine, the, the authorization by law for use is very potent and it's not actually easily defeated in theory or in practice by agreements, licenses, contracts, call them what you will. And although it's certainly true that if under certain circumstances I were to make a, a deal with someone based on an exchange of value in which I promise to renounce some or all of my fair use rights with respect to a particular work, it's certainly true that in the future, I might be bound by that deal. But that proposition, which is undeniable, is in itself relatively trivial in the real world of software licensing. And that's for a number of reasons which are summarized here. I can't remember who was going to take the first one, Brandon. <laughs> That's a good question. We can no, just go I, back. I'll do it. So okay. obviously, because we don't know, no one knows because they're nowhere to be found, we don't know the 
exact terms of every end user license associated with every legacy software package commercialized within the last 50 years. We do know about some, and what we know is that based on the sample that we can get access to, it's really, really, really rare. If we weren't lawyers, we would say unknown, but since we're lawyers, we'll say really, really, really rare, for the agreement to include anything that looks like an express agreement on the part of the user to forego preservation activities or even to forego fair use, which can involve other things than preservation, of course, as a category. Later on, nowadays, as licensing has gotten more sophisticated and things are being you know, distributed in, in new and different ways, terms like that pop up, not commonly, but at least occasionally. But in the legacy software period with which this project is associated, they just don't seem to be there as a matter of description. So that's the first reason why, even if you don't know what the license associated with a particular program said, you probably don't need to be tremendously worried about the possibility that it could be a restriction on your professional work. Over to you, Brandon. Yeah, and so what we, what we found when we looked at the licenses that we could find was that uh, if you pay attention to the wording of the license, um, what the licenses do is they tell you, here's what this license permits and here's what this license does not. Uh, you may do this under this license, you may not do that under this license, right? This is a license for your personal use and not for your business use. This is a license for three computers and not for 10 computers. All of that is fine and good. What it tells you is the scope of the license. But as we've learned on the previous slide, fair use can go beyond the scope of the license, right? And so we, sh we need not and should not read language that very literally and clearly says, this is what's in the license as somehow impliedly or you know, magically excluding your legal rights, which come from beyond the license. Um, and so that's really the, the most common source of confusion here um, to me was that folks would see a license that says that kind, you know, says this is what our license allows and this is what our license does not allow. Um, what, but what, what those licenses very rarely say is, you know, we block fair use or we block preservation. You will hereby promise not to engage in fair use. Um, and I want to make sure we get over to Lauren and, uh, and Dana. So, uh, Peter, can we move a little more quickly through the well, last? Of course we can. There's really very little to be said about the, <laughs> the rest, and I will do it very quickly. And the, the third one is really just an explanation of why the second principle operates. No court would ever read a license willy-nilly to exclude fair use unless it actually said that because fair use is so important. For those people in institutions who are dealing with material that they themselves didn't purchase, that was donated or purchased from, that they didn't purchase from the source, that was donated or purchased secondhand, then there's another interesting um, ancient but powerful principle of contract law, which says contracts, and that's what a license is, a contract, don't apply except between people who are parties to those contracts or who are in some kind of tight relationship with parties. And this is the privity principle. And in most cases where you're dealing with secondhand or donated material, there's no privity between the archive and the original licensor. So whatever the software says, excuse me, the license said, it probably doesn't matter. And then finally, and this is important from a risk assessment, point of view, let's suppose that you were in one of the 
the tiny, perhaps speculative range of cases in which a license might actually operate to control what would otherwise be fair use preservation act activities. And the right question is, how much trouble could you get into if you made the wrong call? And the answer is not very much, because the only thing you'd be liable for is the breach of the license, not for copyright infringement. You are, after all, doing fair use, but for breach of the license terms. And licenses, when the license or any kind of contract goes to court, then the court asks, well, how much real harm was done? And if there was any, they might give compensation. But almost by definition, in the case of preservation, good faith preservation of a legacy program, the actual measure of real harm in dollars is going to be nil. And that's right. So now I would love to turn it over to Dana Boquin to talk a little bit about her work with source code. Dana. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. You sound okay, great. Okay, great. So I was going to talk a little bit about um, just like a specific case that I think is pretty illustrative of um, why source code and like uncompiled code, non-executable uh, code more broadly, has some other nuances baked into it that we're still trying to grapple with when it comes to fair use or figuring out licenses and what we can do to both preserve this content, but also to document it. Because um, I'm essentially coming from a landscape where for the most part, the things that our community builds, uh, code, and simulations and theoretical models, uh, those are existing in a distributed capacity. So there, we are often not the direct stewards of these objects, and instead we have to help support um, our community's ability to document them for potential reuse and for description, but also for that attribution piece that was mentioned a little bit earlier because if we want to be able to make it so the community can both reproduce this work and validate their findings, we also need to make it so that they have a job to do that. So doing actual uh, career pathways, um, having actual career pathways for these people depends a lot on their ability to get credit for their work. Um, and this gets a little hazy sometimes, so I'm happy to talk in tons of depth about the attribution piece of this, but when it comes to licensing, if there's not a clear way to document even the license, we start to get into the realm where we're falling back a lot on attribution, if that makes sense. So for instance, I have up here a link to something called the IDL Astronomy Library. Um, so IDL is a programming language, a proprietary programming language, uh, that was used profusely throughout the astronomy and astrophysics community um, for all kinds of purposes uh, from the 70s actually on through now. So people are still using IDL, but it is a proprietary language and the code that they've written is source code, but IDL actually has explicit licensing that's actually never been tested in the courts where they actually tried to prevent bytecode compatibility with other environments. So they are explicitly trying to tell you through their licenses that you are not allowed to kind of make this compatible with another tool. However, by the nature of the work that the community is doing, a lot of this code is built into pipelines because it's distributed. So for instance, the Solar Dynamics Observatory and all of the pipelines that are used to pull down roughly about like a terabyte a day of just like raw image files, uh, all of that was originally written in IDL and Fortran, and a lot of it still is. Um, but because the community has seen how this does not scale, um, it's not nearly as flexible as they want it to be, and the licenses are very expensive, there's this odd window in the history of IDL, uh, where astronomers started wrapping IDL code with Python scripts. And because they are um, kind of 
trying to find a way out of IDL at this phase, they're falling back on attribution. So they are doing their own fair use, essentially, of some components of IDL to do this stepping stone, essentially, to more open tools. And so as someone who wants to make it so people can get proper attribution for and credit for their work, but also find a way to document these things so that we can capture and archive them. These are the kinds of things that propose, that kind of pose these new challenges. Because we actually, so we go from this still necessary proprietary code to this, what I'm calling just wildcard stuff, where they're purposefully mixing these things together uh, to this open code that has now been often based on proprietary work um, and where we still have these documentation issues, although like I can talk all I want about code meta or citation files and structured ways to document these things, the licensing situation here uh, stays a little bit strange no matter what. And I kind of put a link at the bottom here because this I do not think at all is a isolated instance. Uh, the programming language Julia uh, it's a vectorized language, so it kind of incorporates some of the really great functionality that R has into this much more flexible general use language, is really getting picked up by the astronomy community. And one of the first uh, Astro Julia packages that they've put out is an IDL package. So all of these communities are trying to find ways to uh, take these proprietary things that their work has relied on so heavily and they are trying to incorporate that into what they're doing in the open now. And because we're not the direct stewards, again, we're not receiving this as like a deposit to us, but we're having to find ways so that we can index this content so we can find it and document it and point to where it actually is. Um, we're falling a lot on attribution. So I'm happy to kind of talk more about um, what we're doing to navigate this and the literacy challenges that this is sometimes incorporating. But I will say that um, we're currently working with the Harvard, the cyber law clinic on a little bit of a legal study. They're doing a st staged kind of study here to look at um, kind of what our legal risks are as an institution if we start trying to capture and distribute this sort of content. Because although the, um, the, the code of best practices kind of says, you know, for most of the time you don't want to distribute this stuff, that's kind of the opposite of what the community expects. So this is a very open community and they expect to be able to like find and read everything because they're all reusing each other's work because you can't redo observations. <laughs> and mm -hmm. for the most part, they've actually given up numeric determinacy, if that means anything to you. So what they're actually trying to share is a functionality of a model and the mechanisms by which it works. So repeating a result isn't actually what they're trying to do. Um, they're gonna get a slightly different result every time just by the nature of the thing. So being able to share the source code as openly as possible, even when it is this proprietary or Frankenstein type stuff, is a little hazy, so we're still kind of working out exactly what language uh, and how we're going to advise our community. Wow, <laughs> very interesting stuff. Thanks, Dana. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. And it's interesting. It's another. It's an example of uh, attribution as sort of an all-purpose um, show of good faith mechanism. Um, so, okay, thank you. And Lauren, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about our friends at Vectivex. <laughs> sure. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, so kind of completely switching over now to commercial uh, software. So UVA Library, is, as Jessica said in her introduction, so we're part of the cohort of what is known as the Fostering the Community of Practice. Uh, and that is under the umbrella of some of SPIN's IMLS funding. So it's a small cohort and our project is known as Emulation in the Archives. And what that is, is a fairly scoped project that focuses on a manuscript collection from a local architect uh, here in Charlottesville. 
and the donation from his widow included commercial software, uh, which is a CAD BIM software known as Vectorworks, uh, that was part of this collection. So it came in with manuals. Um, there's a couple of iterations of the software included in it, and it's necessary for us to perform these preservation and access actions to the accompanying born digital collection files uh, that are also part of this collection. So um, I just wanna note that this project is very much still in progress. So there could be updates that come with this uh, over the next couple of months, but for the scope of our project, we really wanted to focus on providing access to this software and these software dependent digital collection materials in an emulated environment in our reading room only. So really, you know, with no ability to really download materials. Um, and I wanted to stop here and say why we were anticipating the need to apply this fair use kind of principles for this developing project instead of doing something like, you know, buying a license for new software, because this is definitely a, a company that's still in existence. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, one is that the older versions of the software that are in this collection, so this collection came in before my time at UVA at around, I think, 2010, 2011. Um, so a lot of the versions of the software predate that by at least 10 years. So these are uh, old versions of the software that um, correlates kind of specifically to these digital architectures. So these versions of the software are no longer being supported or sold by this company. Um, the other reality of folks who are probably familiar with CAD BIM software, it iterates extremely quickly. It's highly complex. You know, there's a lot of things like third-party plugins, uh, different design features, libraries, things that change over time. So new software in 2019 would likely not support many of the features um, from software that was in 2005. Uh, and we need that to be able to accurately render the digital materials that are um, reliant on this software. Uh, it's very much in our preservation mandate to ensure that we get software and software dependent digital materials off of physical mediums. You know, optical discs are not forever either, uh, and hard drives are not forever. Uh, so this is part of our preservation mandate. And we also really have a strong research and teaching use in our architectural school um, and a pretty strong institutional mission related to this. So access to older software and files dependent on that software could really be a very important teaching tool as well. Uh, and we've actually identified this as one of the user groups, you know, within the scope of our FCOP project. So jumping in a little bit about our licensed software specifically. Um, so it's mostly, Vectorworks is part of a, a much bigger company, the Nemetschek Group, which is uh, headquartered in Germany. Uh, and Vectorworks specifically is proprietary CAD software. Um, and the one other thing I wanted to highlight before kind of transitioning to the components of the paths that we talked to Brandon about, um, are kind of around this idea of authentic access to these born digital files that are part of this manuscript collection. So authentic access, you know, in our case for the manuscript collection, means that researchers and users in an environment that under allows for kind of an understanding of how a work itself is rendered, created, developed, iterated, uh, and used in the course of the architect over time. So something I've been thinking about more often in, in talking with the archivist working on this, touching on you know, ideas around provenance. What is the collection and where did it come from? Um, we have a lot of large scale printouts that are also part of this collection that are heavily marked up by architects. You know, you can see iterations, you can see comments on these things. And I've been thinking about this as somewhat analogous to what we could, you know, find in the 2004 files from this collection where the kind of iterative use um, that we'd be able to find through observing it uh, in the version of 2004 software, you know, that relates to these 2004 files, seeing these kind of iterative components um, and working documents are very much part of that. So kind of final point here of the pathways of, you know, talking to Brandon about this, um, a couple of things that have happened given this architect, you know, the um, archival landscape of this collection is that uh, updating the deed of gift, which folks talked about a little bit earlier, was very much part of this. This came in at a time where we did not have a digital addendum as part of our um, practice for deed of gifts. So that's something that we 
you know, really want to make sure has been updated for many of the reasons already highlighted here. Um, the other big thing that came in with this collection, which may be of interest to folks who may have things like this, are that we had both the manuals, which include the license terms, as well as the license keys. Um, and this is something that, you know, I'll let Brandon touch on a little bit here too, but this, you know, um, idea around the fact that we have this commercial software, we have the keys to the commercial software environment and what that means, uh, thinking about licensing terms. So I'll end there uh, and, and turn it back over to Brandon for additional elaboration on that. Yeah, hey, so, um, uh, you know, I, I think actually, uh, so that was a, thank you, Lauren, first of all. Um, that's a, it's a great story. I think it's just, um, it fits perfectly with the kinds of use cases that we heard in the small groups as well. Um, the, the notion that, you know, in some sense, uh, if you can't open these files in the software where they were created, you're losing access to information. You're not seeing the file the way it was made. You're not going to see the layers. You're not going to see the revision history. You're not going to experience it the way the author did. Um, so the, the research value is just undeniable. So we're really excited to be able to work on that. Um, and, you know, I looked at the license. Uh, I read the terms, and they fit in exactly with the kinds of trends that Peter and I described. You know, this is a license that tells you what the license tells you. It tells you what the license is going to let you do, and what the license is not going to let you do. And we are not going to be doing things the license let us do, but that's okay because Section 107 of the Copyright Act lets us do the things that we want to do, and the Code of Best Practices tells us that the things we want to do are reasonable and uh, normal and, and you know, uh, justified. So uh, this might be a really good time then to see what kinds of questions folks might have had in the chat while we've still got a little time before the top of the hour. Yeah, um, thank you, Lauren, Dana, Brandon, and Peter. Um, as Brandon said, please do feel free uh, to post any questions that you have in the chat. I know it's a lot of information. I think that those examples were incredible, hugely illustrative and hopefully thought provoking. Um, thank you again, Lauren and Dana. So we'll give everyone an opportunity uh, for the next few minutes to post any questions that you have. It can also be for Brandon and Peter in regards to the contextual information they provided at the top of the hour. So yeah, um, everyone feel free. I think in the short term, I'll ask a question to get things going, which is, um, Dana, back to your example. So in terms of um, exactly how the work with the Cyber Law Clinic and the Code of Best Practices is informing policy um, at the Center for Astrophysics, in terms of how you're treating um, IDL, the example that you provided, how, how much um, how much discussion about similar examples are happening in your professional circles at large when it comes to research source code, especially legacy proprietary research source code, like the, like the example that you provided? Yeah, so the study that we're doing with the Harvard Cyber Law Clinic, what we're trying to do is have that be kind of a graduating up to more sophisticated and complicated cases. Um, for the most part, the, oh, sorry, I'm hearing a lot of echo. Um, that may be my, they, 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 that may be my fault. fault. Would somebody? Oh, there you go, there. Peter. <laughs> sorry about that. So uh, what we're doing is we're trying to move up in sophistication of the kinds of questions we're asking around proprietary source code, because a lot of the community has shifted over to more open tools. Um, but so a lot of the talk about attribution or even uh, software publishing. So in our community, there are software papers or code review um, as a peer reviewed process. And so like we have a lot of people who publish in the Journal of Open Source Software. So there's tons of conversation about software and what we're capturing and who we're giving credit and how we're documenting it. But for the majority of these kind of more legacy projects, that is a conversation that's going on more internally at the institutional level. For the most part, it's kind of almost in this web archiving discussion to some point, because these are 
projects, um, for instance, like Spec2D, there's a couple of them where they are these components of pipelines that people have incorporated into all kinds of web applications in particular. And so um, I guess to say where we're going with that is we're starting with this one study on IDL with a couple of examples of projects that used IDL so that we can come up with kind of a vanilla language and policy to kind of advise the community on when they're sharing and building on this kind of work. So they mitigate legal risks, but then also graduating up from there to figure out what are the things that we want to actually try to archive as an institution, what resources will we put into them, and to what extent are we going to continue to maintain the licenses. So some of these tools, they have these bigger licensing platforms and we have an institutional license. To what extent are we actually trying to um, kind of like emulate an application that might use like a couple of open tools, but then it's also got some like potentially proprietary Unix libraries and some old astrometry tools. This one website might use like four or five of those things. To what extent are we going to invest in maintaining that functionality? Um, yeah, that's a really important, really important institutional policy and resourcing question, Dana. And it definitely um, reflects a lot of what Lauren was talking about in terms of digital addendum development and things like that as far as the the crossover to the curatorial threshold from from researchers and other members of your um, community that are going to be donating those materials. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and actually that's an open question to all attendees here today, maybe in the time that we have left, if uh, another question doesn't pop up, which is, is anyone willing to offer maybe some initial thoughts, at least, about where your organization is at in terms of thinking about software preservation's impact on your existing policies, um, especially some of the specific examples that Lauren and Dana highlighted uh, in today's episode? Yeah, you know, while people are thinking about that and maybe typing in the chat, uh, Dana's story gave me, two, I had two thoughts about that. Um, one is that there is a, uh, a long and honorable tradition of using the codes of best practices as a, um, as a tool to empower clinics that you're working with who need to help you through specific challenges that you're having. So in the documentary film community, um, there's, uh, there's just a cottage industry of IP law clinics all over the country, who, including especially the one where Peter and I have worked together in the past, where filmmakers would come to us, they bring us the film, and what the code does is it gives the law students a very workable framework they can apply to the film and say, you know, this film is within the the framework of the code, and then they can write an opinion letter, and that opinion letter is a very powerful tool in the context of documentary film distribution. And so it, it may well be that this code could have a similar application that uh, folks who are faced with a tricky situation and who might have access to a law clinic like the Berkman uh, Clinic at Harvard, um, they could bring the code into that conversation as a tool that I think can provide a lot of scaffolding for the law students who might otherwise feel like they were starting from zero. Uh, That's what we're hoping. That's yeah, we're hoping. good. Yeah, Craig, you know, Chris and Kendra are very well aware of the code, so I'm sure we're in the, we're in the mix with them. And then the other thing is, um, you know, the Dana's comment reminded me of my general view of fair use and licensing, you know, my grand unified theory of fair use and licensing on a time scale is that you know going forward if you can start fresh you want to use open licenses and that will make everyone's life easier and you know there's a lot of discussion about licensing for good in the context of software and you know communities who use open licenses and that's great but the problem is we've got a half a century plus of people who didn't have open licenses or weren't using them consistently and then exactly. they just <laughs> <laughs> and so Fair use to me is just the, the solvent that can really help us make progress there. So I'm very hopeful, Dana, that, that it'll be helpful for you. Well, thank you both. I mean, I think that that's kind of just the land that we're in right now is this big transitional period. And even just on a literacy standpoint, teaching people about explicit licensing and all of that is still an issue. 
for sure. All right. Well, we're about at the top. Jessica, was there anything else? No, I think that's it. I would encourage everyone. I know it's always a lot of information to process in a single episode. So if you think of questions as you start to parse the examples that were provided by Lauren and Dana today, and you think about them in relation to your own practice and your own organizational context, please don't hesitate to forward those questions on to myself. The contact information for our speakers will be provided, um, or the rest of the research team for the Code of Best Practices for Fair Use and Software Preservation. And we'll try our best to field uh, responses to those questions and bring them out into the open, because I'm sure if you have them, other people will have them as well. And with that, I'll just say, Huge thanks again to the entire Code of Best Practices research team, to your facilitators, Brandon and Peter, and a warm thanks to our esteemed guests today, Dana Boquin and Lauren Work, and also to all of our attendees uh, for joining us in discussion today. Um, join us next week, same time, same place, episode five, where we're gonna be looking at understanding the circumvention rules and the preservation exemptions around software preservation. This will feature Kendra Albert of the Harvard uh, Law School Cyber Law Clinic, which was mentioned several times uh, in this episode, as well as Jonathan Band, who's counsel to the Library Copyright Alliance, and Lindsay Moulds of Rhizome. So next week's episode will be facilitated by Brandon Butler, oh, pardon, by uh, Krista Cox um, of the Association of Research Libraries, as well as Peter Yazzie of the Washington School of Law at American University. And thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. We'll see you next time. Bye, all.